One of the oddest features, you might say, of the gospel accounts is Jesus talking about his return. Um, he does, of course, appear to Paul on the road to Damascus, but otherwise one is left thinking, well, when is this coming? And I think in the early church there was a sense this was coming very soon. And now after 2,000 years we think, well, maybe not. <laughs> um, so what, how do you interpret those verses? Yes, Jesus does uh, at the very end say things like that. And when Jesus finally disappears, um, there's this rather odd record in the book of Acts where an angel says, this same Jesus who you've seen go will come in the same way. There is a major problem here, which you better name right off the top, which is the problem um, which looms more large again, I'm sorry, in America than anywhere else, because American dispensationalism with the idea of the rapture has actually turned the idea of Jesus' second coming into its opposite. In the New Testament, the second coming is not Jesus coming back to scoop up some people and take them off to heaven with him. In the second coming passages in the New Testament, Jesus is coming back to rule and reign and transform the world and make it over anew. And that is actually part of the whole New Testament package of new, te new heavens and new earth. That, um, uh, put it another way. There's a couple of verses in the New Testament which instead of talking about Jesus coming, talk about Jesus appearing. This is in Colossians 3 and 1 John 3, if anyone is wanting the references. What does it mean appearing rather than coming? And here we have a problem because of our implicit cosmology. We have an implicit cosmology in which heaven is a long, long way away, probably up in the sky somewhere. And then we think of earth as, as all the way down here. So we think of Jesus as coming like a spaceman, having to make a long trip from somewhere else. And I, I know because I've met them and I've had letters from them, there are a lot of people who take that as completely literal language, as though heaven is a space within our cosmos. That is not how the Bible uses the word heaven. The word heaven has a multiplicity of meanings, but in this sense, heaven is God's space, and God's space is supposed to be eventually integrated with our space, call it earth, if you like. And the point is that at the moment, it is as though there is a great curtain hanging down through the middle of ordinary reality so that at any point in any place, God is not far away, Jesus is not far away, it's just that they're currently invisible. But one day, the curtain will be pulled back, and it won't be like coming, it'll be like appearing. You imagine the gasp as if somebody were to yank a great curtain back there, and we suddenly realized all sorts of things going on behind that curtain that were actually integrated with our reality and we didn't realize it. That's as good a picture as the idea of him coming. Now, part of the difficulty here is that some of the passages in the Gospels which have traditionally been taken as predictions of Jesus coming back after a long period are not, in fact, they are predictions of the fall of Jerusalem. In Mark 13, for instance, in the parallel passages, it doesn't begin with the disciples saying, when are you coming back? It begins with Jesus saying, all this stuff's gonna come crashing down, and the disciples saying, when? When will that be? The difficulty is, and this is a real difficulty, especially at, that the language which they used to describe events like that was what some people have sometimes called apocalyptic language. That is to say, things like the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will be turned into blood and the stars will be falling from heaven. Now, generations of Christians have thought that Jesus was predicting the end of the space-time universe. However, when you trace that language back into the Old Testament, and that bit about the sun and the moon and the stars comes from Isaiah 13, it isn't talking about the collapse of the space-time universe, it's talking about the fall of Babylon, which was the greatest empire of the day when that was written, or around the time that was written. Because when this huge empire, which has dominated the horizon, suddenly falls with a crash, what language are you going to use? What poetry can you use to signal that? And when it's Jerusalem, and if you're a Jew who believed that that was the city where God had promised eventually to come and live forever, if that falls with a crash and the temple is burnt to the ground, you're going to talk about the sun and the moon and the stars. I mean, even in our political discourse, we talk about landslides and earthquakes, and we all know that that's a metaphor. Well, they all knew that this language was a metaphor. My colleague John Barton in Oxford 
I remember saying in a lecture once, uh, that we ought to know as a matter of literary genre that if an ancient Jewish text says the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood and the stars will fall from heaven, we ought to know that the next line is not going to be the rest of the country will have scattered showers and sunny intervals. You know, this is, this is, not, this is not a primitive weather forecast. Um, and and there's, it's a very telling. The prophet Jeremiah had prophesied that Jerusalem would fall, and he said that that would be like the whole of creation going back to tohu abohu, which in Genesis means without form and void, to a primeval chaos. Now, for a long time, Jeremiah lived with the possibility that he might be a false prophet because Jerusalem had not fallen. But when Jerusalem did fall, nobody was going to accuse him of being a false prophet because the earth had not gone back to chaos. That was what that language had meant. So we have to be very careful, but so that a lot of the prophecies are not about, in fact, the collapse of the, uh, of the universe, that they're actually about the fall of Jerusalem. One other thing, Jesus told stories, two in particular, one in Matthew, one in Luke, about somebody going away on a journey, giving his servants money to trade with and do business with, and then coming back to see how they were getting on. Many Christians have read those stories as though this is about the second coming at the end of the Christian history when the church will be judged according to whether it's done what Jesus wanted it to do in the meantime. It's actually very clear, particularly in Luke's version of that story, in Luke 19, that's not what's going on at all. And here's something which most modern Christians have not even begun to get their heads around. Jews in Jesus' day lived in hope, and the center of the hope was that the God who had abandoned them at the time of the exile 450 years earlier or so would eventually come back in all his shining glory to live in the temple at last. There is no scene in the whole second temple period which says he's come back at last. Jesus is telling stories about the God who left his people things to do but would come back. And he's telling those stories because Jesus himself in coming to Jerusalem is embodying the return of Israel's God to Zion. This is a whole huge theme, which I think most people as they read the Gospels or Paul have not even begun to imagine, but it looms very large in the Jewish writings of the period, and somehow we have to factor it in. So yes, the second coming is important, but the thing which was gonna happen within a generation was the fall of Jerusalem, and we don't find in the second century or in the third century people saying, oh dear, oh dear, it hasn't happened yet. They still say, no, it might happen at any time. They are, they are not stuck on the this generation thing. 